the very first thing I ever drew in a Disney movie was actually leaves, you know? I was the leaf guy at Disney, sitting at a desk, drawing. I had blisters on my fingers, for real. We worked at Disney World. When we wanted a break, we'd go on Star Tours, we'd go on a roller coaster, you'd go on Space Mountain. The very first movie I directed, the executive goes, I don't like where this movie's going. We're shutting it down. We're going to meet tomorrow. And rather than coming to the meeting the next day to tell us that we were fired because she didn't like our movie, we had one night and we're like, dude, let's come up with something. Three new ideas. She didn't ask us and show her something more than what she wanted. And she goes, you know what? These are the guys that are going to be able to go through the trenches and make this film. And she chose one of the other ideas and we made an entirely new movie. There's two words I love for life, and that is exceed expectations. I mean, you've had, like, honestly, a bananas career, but all of this stems from this constant theme of just, like, working your ass off. Drawing, animation, creativity didn't necessarily come naturally to you. You worked your ass off. You didn't get handed a job at any of these places. You worked your ass off. Right. Wow. Wow. That's, an, that's, a, that's a heck of an intro. And you, you really are nailing it. Um, what you're asking to me is, what made you think you could even do the things you've done? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, like in kind of right? a crazy way, right? Right. Like, are you an idiot? Like, what okay, I wasn't going to take it there, but let's, let's take <laughs> no, it there. But, so are you an idiot? Like, what made you well, think you could do it? I mean, the truth is, we all need to see ourselves that way a little bit. You know, I've, I've, I've had doubt throughout my life. I've had doubt throughout my life. But while wherever I've had doubt in any aspect of my life, I had something that was more. I had this naive, idiot-like fantasy that I could accomplish something. I mean, I'll tell you just one moment in my life that will give you that will kind of sum up that feeling. I think I was about 12 years old. I grew up in New York. I'm standing next to a basketball court. The New York Knicks are about to play Michael Jordan, my hero growing up. And I'm standing next to the court before the game. And Jordan's got those breakaway basketball pants. He's dribbling the ball. And he has that game face, that focus. He's chewing his gum, just warming up. And I'm standing next there. I'm like 11, 12 years old. My older brother's standing next to me and I'm watching my hero. And I said to my older brother, Jay, I'm going to go out there and meet Michael Jordan right now. My brother's like, he ain't going nowhere. And before he could finish that sentence, my feet are on the court, walking out to the middle of the court. Who does that? I was nuts. I stand in the middle of the court. I'm looking up to the, to the God of Michael. And I said to him, hi, Mr. Jordan. And he looks down at me and says, quote, yo, how you doing? End quote. <laughs> <laughs> and he shook my hand. He shook my hand, which I've never watched, Mark. I never watched it, right? It still has the sweat. But look, yeah, the yeah. reason I walked out there is, could I have gotten busted from the security guards? Yeah, of course. But when I get that passion, that dream, that vision of myself accomplishing something or doing something, the excitement is not just that I'm going to get to that. The excitement is I love the the ride to get there. That first step out on the court, Mark, was as exciting as even meeting him. As a matter of fact, if I ever never got to him, the fact that I even walked out there, that was it already. That's what I wanted. I just live for those kinds of moments. <laughs> I'm, as you're speaking, I'm thinking of all those moments where they're scary or I, I'm challenging myself and I've literally just had to say like one foot in front of the other. Now, in, yeah. in my... in, in like. I don't really like being center stage. I mean, I like the spotlight, but my wife is this this woman who like we're in Jamaica and she goes like we're we're at a club where you know and and there's a band playing. And she goes there's a live band playing. Let's go dance. And I go like no one no one is dancing. And she's like let's let's go dance. She takes my hand and like the whole time I'm like I do not want to be walking up I here. I do not want to be dancing. I I, the sweat is rolling down my back. I'm like, everyone is looking at me. And then and then people start dancing, right? So I can just imagine these moments in my life where you're like, yeah. I, I am your brother who's like, you don't walk up to Michael right. Jordan. But let me ask you, after that dance with your wife, you're happy she brought you out there. Come on. You know, you know uh, most yeah. of the time, you don't have to admit it because she's probably going to listen to this. Yeah, Jacqueline, so I do not enjoy you 
making he's me lying. Oh, that's that's he's actually lying. true. On the, uh, I've told her that time and again. You know what? I I never want to do anything ever. And then she makes me, and I'm like, that was fun. Why why right. don't we why don't we do more of that stuff? So right. so this idea of like I'm gonna go walk up to be Michael Jordan. Like walk me through because I do know that that the Little Mermaid was a moment in your life, right? Like yeah. like it was this. It's this moment as a young boy. You know, you're you're watching the the Little right. Mermaid. You're watching right. it's it's, and I know because I've dug into you know Howard Ashman, the, the playwright who you know. There's a yeah. great documentary on on Disney Plus about his life and just the shift actually in Disney animation. Even not to get too like inside, but just the shift of that era moving into a new style of music, a new style of animation, a new style of everything. And yet, that's that's a pivotal movie that also changed your life. Oh yeah, it is. Um... Yeah. And that was a shift because first of all, Disney studios was going to close down right before the little mermaid. You got to imagine Walt Disney made all those movies with his team, Peter Pan, Fantasia, Cinderella jungle book is in production. Walt dies. They finish the movie jungle book does huge numbers. And now they're like, what's the next movie? And they used to walk around the studio saying, well, what would Walt do? Right. What would Walt do? But he was dead. They didn't know. And animators started making movies for themselves. They made the Black Cauldron. I don't know if you've ever seen that. You probably uh, not, never heard of I, it. Oh, not only have I have heard you? of it, but the, the <laughs> okay. book series, the five book series, it starts with um, the Book of Three and oh, uh, by by Sir Lloyd Alexander. That book series got me into fantasy, actually. Look at you, man. <laughs> you, know, you know your Black Cauldron, dude. That's insane. Oh, the movie is so bad, though. It's but the so series bad. is so good. The series. <laughs> but see, that movie was really dark. And the movie did terrible. Disney animation just didn't have its magic. Yeah. Secret uh, you know, of they Nim made... was around that time, too, wasn't it? Right. That Don Bluth made. Right. That was a Don Bluth film. He had left After Disney. Dark. And by the way, it's interesting you bring that movie up. But, but that movie, which did really well, was made by... Uh, someone who basically created a mutiny at Disney. He leaves Disney animation, takes all these animators with him, creates secret of Nim. It does well. And Disney loses their foot and they have no vision. They're going to close down the studio. And Michael Eisner takes over, brings in Jeffrey Katzenberg, Roy Disney, Walt's nephew hires them both. And Katzenberg comes in and says, what do you guys have going? And Ron and John, these young filmmakers were like, look, we had this Hans Christian Andersen story, The Little Mermaid floating around. Let's work on that. And they start writing it and they bring in Alan Menken and Howard Ashman, which they came from theater, Broadway. They did Little Shop of Horrors and other things. And it was a whole departure. And they came up with a fresh new thing. And like you said, look, I was a little kid watching that movie. Look, I grew up in New York. I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was 11 and I saw the movie E.T. That was what started it for me. I grew up in a house where my sister was into Jane Austen. My brother was into basketball and sports. And I was the crazy artist kid who was always creating something. Uh, I was the nut. You know, I was that solid C plus student. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> who doodled in his. If my kids are listening just on a couple of classes. Kids, you're allowed. Okay. Yeah, he paid, he paid attention a lot and got a great lot. grades. <laughs> right. I got A's in art. Okay. So just chill. All right. So look, I see ET. I want to be a filmmaker. I want to be a director. I go out and get a film camera. I get my older brother, my sister. I start making movies with kids in the neighborhood. I made murder movies, monster movies. I remember after one movie I made, we tied my sister up to a tree for a kidnap movie. Like that was, it was amazing in high school. I got permission to tie my sister up to a tree. We go into the house to watch the movie. My mom was like, I like the movie, but where's your sister? I said, she's still tied to the tree. What's wrong? You know? So like, I knew I was going to be a filmmaker, a director. And then I'm in the theater and I see the little mermaid. Boom. Everything gets clarified for me. It, animation combines my passion, my love of drawing and my love of filmmaking, put them together animation. I found out that Disney had a studio in Orlando, Florida. I was a junior in high school and that's when my dream was solidified. I knew what I wanted to do, but specifically what it was in The Little Mermaid that, that spoke to me was when Ariel sang that first song, you know, part of your world. And she sings about, I want to be where the people are. She was like, I want to go out there. I want to walk. And it's such a beautiful scene because she sings this line. She has this one lyric. What's a fire in? Why does it? What's the word? Burn. There you go. I just sang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's Enjoying fantastic. That? Right? Now yeah, we're going to get right. copyright strikes on this. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's fair use. Come on. We're talking about it. So she goes, burn. And she puts her hands across her chest, closes her eyes. 
And when she says burn, every fiber of her being is saying, there's a question to me that's burning. I want to understand the world. And it's primal. I always say as a, as a filmmaker, when you're making a story, writing a film, anything or any kind of story, or even sharing your own story, you got to have a window in for the audience to relate to you. You know, when we see the movie like The Karate Kid, when I saw that movie in the theater, I wasn't watching a movie about a kid that wanted to be great in karate. I was watching a movie about a kid that wants to fit in in high school. And karate is the means to achieving that. That wasn't a movie about Luke Skywalker. That was a movie about me. Anytime you're watching a movie and it appeals to you, it's because you find yourself relating to that character. Star Wars, Karate Kid, whatever movie you love, you relate to that character, boom, it impacts you. And yeah, Mark, that was the movie that set me on my goal of, I want to be a Disney animator. I love that so much. And you know, yeah. I, I, I ask this question actually often. Um, you and I have, have met on Clubhouse in the past. And yeah. the question I used to love to bring to rooms, I haven't been on the app in a very long time, but that's a different story. But, but a question I used to love to ask people is, do you think that your favorite movie, either as a kid or even today, says something about your values or your mindset? A hundred percent. And oh, and yeah. you asked me, you know, back back here. It's it's funny because back here, for those who are watching, I have a poster of Tangled up on the wall. It's very oh, yeah. blurry. It's very small. It's 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 amongst three <laughs> different three different things. They're one of my favorite TV shows, uh, my favorite movies. And you were like, "Oh, why is Tangled up on the wall?" <laughs> and it's like, right. That is my favorite Disney movie because, for me, the moment where she decides uh, that she's going to leave the tower. And she has this whole scene yeah. of, I'm, this is the greatest day ever. I'm a terrible daughter. Oh my goodness, this is great. And it's just like the, the manic to fear, to mania, to fear, like that moment of, of breaking out of the safety of the tower and the world. And she's going to disappoint people, but she has this drive and this desire to see the lights. Like, like that moment perfectly captures what what I love about courageous people, what I love about those who pursue their passions, what I love about the people who go into the arts or go into whatever it is that the world tells them they can't do, that scene captures it for me. And I, I love said. that. I love it so much. <laughs> And you know what, Mark, that movie was also a very pivotal film for the Disney Studios. I don't know if you know the history of that movie in particular. It was in development for years. It had an incredibly different tone. It was a heartfelt movie. It didn't have, it wasn't even a comedy. It was a whole different thing. And Glenn Keane was directing it and developing it. He's an Oscar winning, one of the best Disney animators that ever lived. And I remember going to one of those early screenings and it was just a, it was, it had the depth of the Lion King. It was a very emotional film and the studio just wanted to go a different way. And they took Glenn off the project. I think he was had his heart on something else anyway. And they brought in one of my dear friends, Nathan Greno, who is the quirkiest, funniest, craziest nut in the world. I mean, we went to college together. He's one of my closest friends. I mean, I can tell you stories after stories well, of this I, guy. I, I know that they had I to mean, rework it to like, because they're like, oh, we want to bring in more boys and, and we want to make. But the thing that breaks the thing that breaks me up about this movie and yeah. we're way on a tangent is, is making the horse act like a dog, like just right. like saying like, we don't even care. Like, like we're just going to make this horse character 100% a dog. <laughs> that's, that's Nathan. That's this guy. This is, that's this buddy of mine. See that movie took risks. And let, let me highlight something that your listeners can really walk away with specifically about the production of that movie. The movie took risks to say in a room, let's make the horse act like a dog. That's a risk to say something like this. Cause everybody around you who's never heard that before is going to look at you and go, what are you crazy? And in order to create something, in order to grow, we got to get out of our comfort zones and be able to take a risk. How do we do that? We have to create something no one's ever seen. And each one of us has a potential to achieve something that no one else ever has because we're unique. But in order to do that, we got to get out of our comfort zone. We got to step on that court like the way I did as a kid to go meet Michael Jordan. And, you know, look, I, I directed a Disney movie, Kronk's New Groove. It was the sequel to Emperor's New Groove, right? And in that film and in Emperor's New Groove, Kronk has this shoulder angel and the shoulder devil, right? And we all have that. The shoulder angel telling us that, you know, we can achieve, we can accomplish, we can aspire, we can change the world. 
then there's that shoulder devil saying, who the hell do you think you are? You're just Saul. You're just you. You're just this normal person. You can't achieve things. You're, you're not Michael Jordan. And each one of us has that, that duality fighting it itself. We got to be able to trust that shoulder angel. Go, you know what? Maybe I can do it. Maybe I can try. And then you get something like Tango. Look, you said that films that we love usually can tell you something about a person's values. I'm going to highlight two of my personal favorite films all time. Here we go. Now I'm going to say the first, and you may roll your eyes because you're going to expect I'm going to say that because, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but if you ask any man, and if there's any men listening over the age of 40. Okay. I'm, your, I'm, I'm, I'm under 40. So this is very interesting. Okay. To me let's now. say 35 to 40. I'm going to okay. ask you, I might be going to tell you, Mark, Mark, let's do a little trivia right now. Okay. Let's, Mark, let's do it. If you ask 10 men yeah. over the age of 35, what's your favorite film of all time that you could watch over and over again? And it's on TV. You can't shut it off. What are they going to say? Come on. Oh, gosh. I feel like pressure now. I, I'm, my gut's going to say Star Wars. Okay. A, first a of all, home. first of all, all these men who I'm talking about are screaming at the, at the YouTube channel right now because they're <laughs> saying the name. No, it's not New Hope. Okay. Rocky. They love it. No, come on, baby. Come on. Here, here's <laughs> just, 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 here's the I scene. feel like I'm here's dancing. Yeah. Look, here's the scene. Come on. Camera above, rain falling at night. No, Shawshank, baby. Shawshank oh, Redemption. Okay. Shawshank Redemption. Got gotcha. you. Was- okay. You're not, you're not sold on that. Are you kidding me? I, I've only, ever, I've only ever seen it once. Oh, you got to see it again. And some of yeah. you, some of you are listening. I want you to write in the comments. Am I right or am I wrong about this? I want to hear. So, so I mean, Shank. I know, I know a lot about, I know a lot about the movie, and it's an amazing. Well, here's amazing here's film, what it but... is. And that movie, I mean, that movie is. I don't want to ruin anything for anyone who hasn't seen it. Uh, so uh, listen, just... listen, hold on. Spoiler <laughs> alert! Come on, it's been, it's, it's like a 1997 film. I know. Isn't it? Like it's over just, 30 freaking years. Just you deserve us. to have it just spoiled. Tell us. Yeah, it's. We're okay. gonna spoil it now. Go. Okay, fine. <laughs> so the guy basically he's in the worst prison in history and he crawls through pipes filled with crap for miles to escape. I'm not going to say if he gets away with it or not, whatever you watch the movie yourself. <laughs> okay, if I still can't spoil it. I'm just a nice guy. What do you want from me? And he gets through the pipes and he's standing there like this with his arms up. And we love that movie, not because we love movies about prisons and people trying to escape. We love movies because it shows us a taste of, yeah, I know what that feels like. I feel in my own life that I'm crawling through crap, that I'm going through hell. Show me a vision of this. My arms up like this, the rain washing away. Tell me that I can revive myself. Tell me that I can still find hope in my life. You know, that's that's the message of that film. That's why we go back to that. And I think it's a, I think it's a thing that, you know, those of us who are over the age of, you know, those of us who have marriages or who have kids or who have careers, you know, you're balancing all this stuff and it's difficult. Look, if you, you know, you, I'm a, I have a teenage daughter. Do you, you have any kids, Mark? Yeah, I got four. My oldest is 15. Okay. So you're going to relate to what I'm talking about. If you think it's easy raising a 15 year old, you are not doing a good job. True. Right. Because it means you're not doing the work. It's it's hard, but it's the best kind of work. True. Yeah. True. Right. We, we go through we go through hell raising our kids, even the great kids like yours, Mark and mine. We have great kids. Right. Mine. mine if, if you're listening, <laughs> they do. They do make it easier for me. So, there so you that's go. good. Right. So even though we have great kids and, you know, all kids are great out there, it still takes a lot of work. But we love those kinds of films that tell us that guess what you're, you're gonna be okay you can okay, do so, this so I'll, so I'll hit me you said two films that's oh. the second one et e. ah e. so you're gonna kill me um i've only ever seen what? et once and i only watched it like six months ago <laughs> oh, really? i never grew up, up watching et did you like it or no uh yeah i did i did like it you know what's what i find interesting i love going back to films like i, I love first of all i love steven spielberg as a director yeah. i went to film school and I think everyone uh, does, but but I I love uh, that that he that he infuses these father father son complication type right. relationships, right? Like that's just exactly. the core of what he does. But what I really love about going back to old films is just the pace is just so slow compared to what's happening these days. Yeah, they, they let really the moments focus. breathe. Yeah, yeah. I was watching a Robert Redford film, um, uh, Quiz Show, and it's just oh, like, great movie. 
yeah, just like let's work through it. Let's have characters. Let's you know. So anyway, a- E. T. That's E. T. By the way, and E. T. is my second favorite movie of all time. I'll just highlight a moment in that movie. You know, E. T. is is a story about this kid and this alien. They have a friendship, and he has to help the alien get home. In the hands of any other filmmaker, we wouldn't be talking about E. T. right now. Just so you know, the thing that made that movie wonderful and unique is that. Elliot is set up as this character, this kid who, while we feel for him and we're sympathetic because he's this middle child and his, his father ran off with some woman, Sally, to Mexico, and he's lost in his home, he doesn't really feel for other people. He says something to mom in the beginning that's a little hurtful, and his brother comes up to him and says, you know, when are you going to start caring about someone else's feelings? And then once he meets E.T., he starts to care so much for E.T.'s feelings. And what does he want? He wants E.T. around him. It's a love story. It's a buddy movie. But if you really love someone, you have to want them to have what they want. And what does E.T. want once they get home? And Elliot's like, I need to sacrifice what I want to give you what you need. And that at the, at the core of that movie, and what's so beautiful is that Elliot starts to feel what E.T. feels. There's that scene where, you know, E.T. is drinking. He's getting drunk. You remember that scene? And Elliot is in school just getting drunk. Like no other writer, no other filmmaker would have come up with that idea. Um, but E.T., those family values, that made me also want to be a better father. My parents were divorced when I was a kid. And that movie propelled me. I was a middle child and I am a middle child. I have an older brother and I have a twin sister who's younger than me. And I related to that character. And uh, that movie propelled me to want to be a better dad. Uh, but I did tell you, Mark, that is my second favorite movie of all time, because I was hinting to see if I'll show you the toy from my desk because you know, I work in animation. We're all just big kids with toys. My first favorite movie of all time. Here is the character. Do you know who this is? I uh- <laughs> no, do you not know? I mean, it's YouTube, so I can show you this. Yeah, I, I don't know. No, no. Okay, this is show me the way to go home. I'm tired. Of, I'll kill him for 10. So this is Quint from Jaws. Show me the way to ah. go home. Yeah, this is the best toy. Oh. This is Robert Shaw from Jaws. That's just so fun about a YouTube uh, interview like this. I get to show my toys. Um, Jaws is my first favorite film of all time. I love great white sharks. They are my greatest fear, uh, but I love them. And that was my entree into Spielberg, the filmmaker. Uh, It's a character movie. It's not about a shark. It's about these three guys that have to work together. I mean, it's just man versus nature, man versus himself. That was the movie that did it for me. And of course, John Williams score, the greatest composer who ever lived. Uh, incredible movie. Uh, that's the movie that made me want to be a filmmaker. And Mark, I got to meet Spielberg uh, when I started directing at Disney. Uh, I was at the opening of the Disney concert hall and Spielberg was hosting that night with Tom Hanks and Catherine Zeta-Jones. And I'm there with my wife and my mom. It's a tuxedo event. I'm sitting in these cheap seats, whatever. And all I know is that's the night I got to meet Steven Spielberg. I said to my wife, I was, you know, 29 years old. I'm going to walk on the court and say, <laughs> I don't know. It's exactly gonna, what happened. I'm going to walk on stage and be like, and sure Spielberg. Enough, <laughs> yeah. I go, I wake my way down to where he's sitting in like row one, whatever it is. And I get him right during that intermission, right? The lights are flashing. I got to get back to my seat. And he's turning around to go to a seat. And I go, hi, Mr. Spielberg. I just want to tell you that Jaws is my favorite film. And I feel like I got, even though we've never met, I feel like I know you through your films. And today I'm a filmmaker. I'm a director at Disney. And I owe a lot of that to you. And he said, quote, thanks. I'll take that home with me. End quote. It was a beautiful thing. It means like, you know, it mattered to him that he, that, that, that I felt that. And I shared it with him. It was just a great meeting. Uh, we took a picture later that night at the, uh, at the dinner and the first digital cameras had just come out and my wife did not know how to use the camera. Is that the so, one, is that the one we had to slide a, a floppy disk into it? Exactly. Ah, I exactly had one of those right. Sony's. You remember that? The Sony. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I got my arm around Spielberg and it's freaking Steven Spielberg. Did I mention it's Steven Spielberg? Right. Okay. So yeah. I got my arm around him and my wife's got the camera and she can't get the camera to work. And how long can you keep your arm around <laughs> Steven Spielberg before it doesn't get a little awkward, right? Well, I'm going for a record, right? So I got my arm around there and he's smiling. I'm smiling. And like five seconds, 10 seconds go by. Finally, he starts directing my wife. He's like, you know, you got to 
which is very cool because my wife got directed by Steven Spielberg. That's pretty cool. Well, there there right? you go. You can have anyway, the list now. Well, today, the proof I have of this moment is I have a beautiful photo of two black silhouettes. I will tell you one is me and one is Spielberg and you'll go, I don't buy it. <laughs> but yeah, you, guys, the never, you guys are in witness protection. At this I point. know it never came out, but it was a great night. But that was the movie that made me really want to be a filmmaker and uh, and believe in myself. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to switch gears a little bit because I, I think anytime that we can have a conversation with someone who's had your career, we can we can certainly focus on the highlights, right? Hey, I met Steven Spielberg and this happened and I directed this movie. But but once you got into Disney, filmmaking is a lot of like tedious work. And especially if you're a junior animator, if you're a junior editor, if you're anything like that, you're not like, you know, <laughs> it's not you're like you're like like, let me invent the main characters for this film, right? Yeah, like yeah. like you're working on like, I'm gonna spend time drawing leaves i'm going to spend time in background animation i'm going to dedicate uh, like i'm the guy who did the waves in, in you know in the background <laughs> like how how do you work through and balance the tedium with the excitement because yeah because so much of success is just doing what you got to do day after day after day it's not meeting steven spielberg all the time that's right wow what a great question i mean mark you're the man you're asking me things no one has ever asked me i love these questions dude you're this is awesome you're welcome um, <laughs> yeah no that's a great question well let me let me say a couple of things first of all you know you bring up like the tediousness and the very first thing I ever drew in a Disney movie was actually leaves. Uh, it was in the film Pocahontas. Uh, you've heard of that, right? That's that's BF before Frozen. Is, yeah. That's how you equate animations. Did AF or BF, right? So that was before Frozen. And um, why? Hold on. Why? Film, why? Real quick, we're going to come back to it. But I would think that, like for me, when I was a kid, Toy Story blew my mind and changed my life because it was well, that the was first. It. Yeah. it was the first digital, you know, like non-animated digital film, and I was like. Oh, and I loved, I loved that movie. Why would yeah, Frozen, yeah. other than the fact that we like the music and you know that it won some Oscars, and and I do love um, the composer who you know all of that stuff. But right. are you just saying it because Frozen? Like no, here's why. Huge? Here's why. I mean, look. First of all, you're right. The biggest game changer. First, Little Mermaid was the biggest game changer because that saved animation. Okay. Uh, the next game changer was Lion King. I mean, a Beauty and the Beast was was I mean everything then was an incredible Beauty and the Beast was nominated for Best Picture Oscar that was a big deal, Aladdin made a lot of money but Lion King made so much money that it 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 awakened people to go I can make money in animation so many studios sprung up after that uh, the money made movie made live action movies look like nothing I mean everybody wanted to get into animation but you're exactly right after that the movie that changed it all was Toy Story the first computer animated movie. It was a comedy. Uh, there was no musical breakout number. I remember I was in Florida working at Disney at the time, and me and all my buddies were invited to a screening. John Lasseter, the director and producer, was screening it for us. And we were the most cynical bunch of people you have ever met. And Mark, we walk into that studio, into that screening room. It's a movie theater filled with Disney animators. And we're like, what's this computer thing? Like, what, what, what is it? You know, there's no music. There's no Alan Menken breakout song. And there was one scene in the first like eight minutes of the movie where the soldiers go down to figure out what the new toy, what the new present's going to be for Andy. And these little green soldiers are there and they're going down and we're trying to get, you know, close. And the mom opens the door. Do you remember what happens? And she steps on one of them because they freeze, right? When adults yeah. come by, when humans come yeah. by and he's lying there all mangled up and but he's frozen. Yeah. And then mom walks away. And he and comes like, out of it again. It's and like he's a like, war what? scene. It's like, we it's a war to scene. Move on. Right. right. Go on without me. Right. Yeah. And we just burst into tears laughing. And we never looked back. And everybody in that theater walked out. I'll never forget walking out into the Disney MGM Studios, what it was called at the time, from that screening. And knowing that everything in animation was changed after that. The next time that happened was The Incredibles. Seeing a movie that just had such a live action feel. We didn't really know you could do that with animation. And Brad Bird came and did that at Pixar. But Frozen, what made Frozen the next version was Frozen took computer animation and said, what is Disney going to do that no one else can do? Let's make a Disney movie again. 
let's have the characters do a schmaltzy song number. You know, how about that word? Schmaltzy. It's a good word, right? Let's, very Yiddish. Do, I love it. <laughs> very Yiddish, right? Let's let Disney do what no one else can do. Let, let's show Disney magic again, but for a new generation. And uh, th- like DreamWorks would never have done that movie. You know, Fox wouldn't do that movie. Illumination that made Despicable Me, they wouldn't have done that movie. But that was really returning to, to a Disney movie again. But but like I was saying earlier, Pocahontas was this film I worked with very, very a long time ago in the 90s. And the very first thing I got to draw in that movie was um, John Smith was talking to Pocahontas in the forest at night. And Cocoa, the Native American guy she's supposed to marry, finds out she's speaking to another guy. He walks through the forest at night and he's peeking through these leaves and they asked me to animate the leaves. That's it. You know, I was the leaf guy. At Disney. And, you know, look, that was okay. I was, I was scared anyway. Did you do a drawing of a leaf on a piece of paper? A leaf is short. It's small, but on a movie screen, it's a 50 foot leaf. It better be a good leaf, right? It was a lot of pressure. Um, So to answer your question, how do you get through the tediousness? Look, when I worked on Mulan, I worked on Mulan for four and a half years, sitting at a desk, drawing. I had blisters on my fingers for real. I would work 10 to 14 hour days seven days a week. We were in overtime on that movie. And let me tell you, as tedious it was, and sometimes there are scenes that are exciting, or sometimes, you know, I was animating Shang, the, the male lead. Let's get down to business. Remember that guy? Some scenes, he's just talking and it's boring. And you got to draw that dang armor of his with those lines like a hundred times a week. And it was, it and, was sometimes... And- you know, I've, yeah. I've seen footage of this, but when you're doing it, like you're sketching, you're like, there's to go frame by frame. You have to like flip the page and you have That's to right. constantly check things. There's not That's like, right. it's not like this is like, I have this Photoshop file and that one or anything. It's, it's, you're literally drawing these things out. Right. And as tedious as you think it is, I won't go through all the details and the minutia of it because we'll lose your audience. Cause I would geek out so much with animation. We won't do that, but I will tell you as tedious as you think it is times a billion, my friend. Okay. But let me tell you how I got through it to answer your question two ways. First of all, me and my friends just had the greatest time. You know, we would take a break and they'd push me on my computer chair, you know, my office rolling chair up and down the studio. We worked at Disney World. When we wanted a break, we'd go on Star Tours. We'd go on a roller coaster. You'd go on Space Mountain. I mean, I lived in Disney World. It wasn't even real. My kids are like, Dad, that's not work. I'm like, it was work, you know? But so I just work with great people. But the other, the other way that I was able to get through all that is I never forgot what I was a part of, that that small thing that was on my desk was part of something much bigger, which was Mulan, which was part of something much bigger, which was the Walt Disney Company. And when I would walk out in the parks and I'd see kids wearing T-shirts from Disney movies and things, and I'd be like, you know what? They'd never heard of Mulan yet, but someday they will. And I just felt humbled to be part of that story. You know, a guy came up to me once in a mall and I was promoting the film Pocahontas. He was an older guy. must have been in the 70s. And he said, I just want to thank you for making Fantasia. And I was 24 at the time, Mark. Fantasia came out in the 40s. Yeah. Like, you know, I I wasn't alive for Fantasia. And I remember walking away laughing. And then I realized, oh, you know what? He wasn't thanking Saul. I was representing the Walt Disney Company. And what he was really telling me is this movie has meant so much to me. And I've never gotten to meet anyone from that company. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate the Disney Company and the impact it's made in my life. And I can tell you that humility of understanding what small part we play in a bigger vision, that's what can energize us to be able to persevere. Oh, I love that. My, my wife's grandfather, uh, he was born in 1928 and he's passed now, but um, I, you know, towards the end of his life, we were talking about his favorite things. And for his entire life, Snow White was his favorite movie. You know, 1938, uh, yeah. um, color, first animated film, uh, like full length film. Uh, yeah. music and I always looked back on it and I was just like uh, you know Snow White is is not technically very good because I had no concept of just how much how much these we've already spoken about all these films that just change things but but an amazing story told at the right time can have that huge impact oh, and so yeah. and so you know you have now had the privilege to be able to direct 
these things. And, um, and so what have you learned or what can you help share with our audience just in terms of what makes a great story? What makes a great project? What, what are you looking for? What do you, what do you do to, because I, again, I think often we, from the outside, we go like, this is a steps. You write a story and then you make the story and then it's a hit. And it's like not quite that simple, right? Not quite that simple. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, the thing that I look for in a story, first of all, I see my job as a responsibility. Nothing more, nothing less. You know, my passion is art and animation and filmmaking. And I see the stories that I'm a part of telling as responsibility. You know, I'm looking for values that are in those stories that I want to give to kids. I work in preschool animation right now. Um, I've worked on shows at Disney, like Doc McStuffins and Netflix shows, um, Barbie Dreamhouse Adventures. I just finished a show I'm, I'm producing now, Madagascar, A Little Wild. Um, and By there's the way, a lot of, yeah. I, I love Barbie Dreamhouse. <laughs> I watch it with my younger daughter. It, yeah. It's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, uh, snarky, which I love, but oh my right. goodness, that show's great. It, it is a little snarky, yeah. But I look for those values. Like even if you watch the Barbie show, you know, people would think, oh, Barbie living in Malibu, it's going to be all materialism. But there's so much depth to that show. We want girls to watch that and not just want to have what Barbie has, but to want to have her lens, the way she looks at the world. We want to give kids more. We can't just entertain kids. We have to give them something more, not just give them, as I like to say, the tree, but give them the roots. We have to give them values. That's what I look for. And as a filmmaker, I look for those moments in films where the audience can get sucked in. Like I said earlier, now you mentioned Star Wars earlier. Imagine it's 1970, C-3PO. It's the weirdest thing in the world. We take for granted now that we know who those characters are. But George Lucas, who created that world, was thought of as a nut job. I mean, he created this world with character names, C-3PO, R2-D2. His villain had a mask. The producers at Fox or the executives were like, you can't have a villain in a mask. We've got to see his expression. Everything he did in that movie was crazy. And the actors, they thought Lucas was nuts. Like everyone thought he was crazy. Like how is anyone going to relate to the story about a farmer in space? It was weird. But if you watch that movie, episode four, right? You, a New Hope, which you said beautifully earlier, most people don't know that's called episode four, right? We know. We're Star Wars nerds, right? But if you want me here, I'll just prove my Star Wars nerd shit. And it wasn't yeah. even called A New Hope until they released Empire Strikes Back because it was that's just right. called Star Wars. Star Wars, right. And, and they ended the movie at the with an ending because they didn't know if they get to make another one or not. That's right. They didn't even know. So watch this. But if you if you go back to that movie, the first 15 minutes of that movie, Luke Skywalker buys these droids Right. And he has to clean them up and it's dinner time. He sits at dinner with his uncle and aunt and he says to his uncle, uncle, you know, this summer I want to go off with my friends to the academy. I don't want to stay here and work on the farm. And his uncle's like, but Luke, you told me you were going to help. And Luke's like, but I got these droids. You don't need me. Let me go. And his, son, and his uncle's like, no, you're going to stay here like you promised me. And Luke just gets up from the table, doesn't eat anything and walks away. And his aunt says to him, Luke, where are you going? He turns back and says, looks like I'm going nowhere. Boom. Like we all know what that feels like. And what does he do? He goes outside. You know what the very next scene is? He's polishing the droids, but that's actually not the next scene. There's a moment. This is what makes Star Wars Star Wars. There's a moment where Luke walks outside. The two suns are setting. Remember the scene, right? It's that pink, beautiful sunset behind him. The wind is blowing his face. He looks out into the distance and for the first time, we hear the theme. Dun, 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 dun. The wind is blowing. Dun, dun, dun. He looks out to the distance, the sun. Dun, 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 dun. And in that moment, psh, dun, 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 the music is go. You talked about movies from years ago, how they let you breathe, the pacing. This is the moment where Star Wars became Star Wars, because I'm not watching a story about some kid that's on some farm that wants to be in an academy that I can't relate to. I'm watching a movie about me because we all know what it feels like to want more in our lives, to have hope for something better, to feel like we're not going anywhere. That's why that movie's called A New Hope. And in that movie, I'm watching a movie about me. 
that's the kind of stories I'm looking for. I'm looking to tell stories where people can relate, where kids can see themselves in these characters and they can feel like, you know what? I too can step on that court. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> and you can tell that this guy's a director because he just literally just walked us through. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagined you on a team meeting being like, okay, and then this is happening and this is coming up. I love it. Right, right. But if, if my wife were here, she'd be like, don't start with him on Star Wars because I'll just keep going. <laughs> well, but Mark, do you but, see what I have here? Uh, this is I'm an, I'm an adult and I have toys for movies. I have a DeLorean around here somewhere. <laughs> well, okay. So, I mean, you, you hinted at this. I wasn't even going to ask you this, but but I have to imagine that that whenever you're in a creative space like Disney or like DreamWorks or what have you, that that there's a certain amount of play that helps break through creative barriers and those mm -hmm. types of things. And so how do you, I mean, do you approach things in kind of a structured play? We had, um, we had Julia Cameron on the podcast, the, the author of, you know, the artist way where she mm -hmm. helps, you know, people structure certain things and go through like, what's your approach to be able to, to balance play versus creativity yeah. versus work? Yeah. I mean, I can tell you there's definitely times when before COVID, when I'm driving to the studio and I drive through Coldwater Canyon, that's how I get to work every day. And it's a, a beautiful Canyon. It's a 30 minute drive. And that's my time to reflect on what am I going to write today? That's my time. Like some people say they come up with the best ideas in the shower. For me, it's Coldwater Canyon. Like that's the Canyon where, and I always imagine when I would drive home at night, and I had all these story challenges or problems, whatever we were writing that day. How many other filmmakers or writers driving through cold water are also going through writer's block or going through difficult things? Um, creatively, for me, what I do is I just get up and walk. Like I circle, I'll walk around the studio. I walk through the Disney. When I was at Disney, I'd walk through the Disney studio on the same lot that Walt and those animators made Peter Pan and all those movies. Just walking around and just getting out of wherever whatever room I'm in just gets my blood going and I get moving. But creatively, if there's ever uh, an opposition I had, like I directed uh, movies at Disney with a directing partner for many years. We're not a, a team anymore, but for years, me and Elliot, uh, was, we were directing uh, Kronk's New Groove together or a Winnie the Pooh movie, I think. And he had a Mortal Kombat video game, like one of the old ones yeah. in there. And when he and I had an argument or like, I think it should be blue. I think it should Finish be red. Him. That right? would determine it. That would determine it, dude. <laughs> many, many decisions were made over Mortal Kombat. Yeah, what right? was your character? I like Sub-Zero myself. I was Johnny ah. Cage. <laughs> Do you remember he, that movie when it came out? Oh, like yeah. 95? Oh. Dude, but that techno song was awesome. Man. I love that. I have Mortal it on tape. Do I you? still have it on of tape. Of course you do. Yes. Of course you do. <laughs> But many, many arguments were settled with Mortal Kombat. Yeah. <laughs> so at this point in your career, doing what you've done, has the magic worn off? Has the cynicism come in? Has the, the business side of the business overcome kind of the no, creative not side? not at all. I'm going to tell you, you how did, how, yeah. Hold on to all that. You, you just did it again. Another fantastic question, man. I've never been asked. I love it. Um, you know, when I, when I, wanted to work at Disney. And I dreamed about working at Disney for all those years. Everything about Disney for me was what it is for most of you listening. It was Disney World. It was Peter Pan ride and Lion King and all these incredible movies and magic. When I got to Disney, I had some people that I worked for that were not great bosses. You know, I had some you know people around me that I, I saw some cynicism and I, I it, it be, there were days when it was just work. And for me, I, like I said earlier, when I focus on the audience, who's going to watch it, that just, that, that, that doesn't allow me to be cynical. Like I said, it's a responsibility. Uh, that's what really grounds me. Um, you know, look, I've been in the animation business a long time and I've worked with so many people, so many places and studios. I think the thing that's most different for me now than then is while I take my work incredibly seriously, I don't take myself serious. You know, um, I, I don't, uh, you know, I just, I live for collaboration. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was starting at Disney as a director, okay, I've never shared the story before. One time there was a lot of young directors and we were brought into this big conference room and another director was having trouble on their film. I don't even remember what it was. And 
they brought in all these other writers and directors to kind of give this young director some advice so we could just colla creatively collaborate together. And there was a big story problem and that director just didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden in that room, I had an idea. I don't remember what it was. And I had an idea and I figured out how to solve it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got it. I got it. I know exactly. What to do. And I just start sharing my idea. And I'm telling them this and that and this. And, I, and, I'm, and in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I'm so brilliant. Look at, I just solved this little problem. They're going to give me a freaking raise from this. Did you, did, did, and in my head, I'm like, did you all hear how brilliant I just was? And I leave the meeting thinking I'm God's gift to writing. And later on, somebody calls me into their office and said, you know, you were a little too bulldozing in that meeting. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, and I thought they were just going to compliment me. My boss was going to compliment me. Your idea was great. And I learned a hard lesson that day. This is many, many years ago. That even though you may have the right idea, you have to be a good listener. You have to really be a person that wants to collaborate. You know, you have to be the kind of person when you're creating any form of art form, you have to leave a space for another person. By the way, forget about filmmaking for a second. It's the same in marriage. Mark, you're raising kids, right? You have a, your wife. What's her name? Jacqueline, you said? Yeah, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, right. Right. If, if you have the answers some days on what to do with your kid, you still have to leave a space for your wife. She has, still has to leave a space for you. The best relationships are the ones where we have a space for the other person to be able to contribute. And I learned the lesson earlier on in my career that throughout my career, especially becoming more in leadership as a director and producer, that one of the things I strive for is creating an environment or a culture or helping create that environment where everybody feels heard, where everybody feels like they can contribute. Because when you allow everyone else to contribute, the outcome is so much sweeter. You know, George Lucas was quoted as saying when he made American Graffiti, it was a good movie. It got him on the map as a filmmaker. But they asked him years, why was Star Wars so much better? Because you know why? Because when I made Star Wars, he said the first six months of production, I tried to do everything. And I realized one day that I couldn't. I had to to empower my team. And only when I did that did Star Wars become Star Wars. That's really the mission that I try to uh, hold on to, my friend. You know, Tony Robbins talks about the questions that you ask yourself, and I am obsessed with this idea. The questions you ask yourself lead to the answers that you pursue. And, and I honestly believe asking the right question in the right moment will totally unlock any challenges you're facing. So when you're struggling, when you're up against it, when you're, when you're really feeling challenged, what question do you ask yourself? Yeah, let me think about that for a sec. Um, yeah, when, when I'm going through any challenge creatively and I'm you know, up against it, like you said, you know, when, I'm, when I'm struggling, can't achieve, can't accomplish something, um, the question I, the, the tool that I use or the question I ask myself is, am I thinking too narrow too quickly you have to be careful to get too narrow too quickly because as soon as you become narrow in, in here you're excluding all these other ideas and you do need to do that because as a filmmaker i'm making a movie or creating art and there are parameters money and time and i don't have time to come up with 50 ideas i have i've had times where I've, i did a movie at disney and winnie the pooh movie the very first movie i directed and the, the executive goes, I don't like where this movie's going. We're shutting it down. We're going to meet tomorrow. And me and Elliot, my co-director, we, we thought we we're going to get fired from our first job. And we probably were going to be. And rather than coming to the meeting the next day and wait for the executive to tell us that we were fired because she didn't like our movie, we had one night. And we're like, dude, let's come up with something. Let's come in tomorrow and show her three new ideas. She didn't ask us. Let's give her three new ideas and show her something more than what she wanted. We, you know, this is a, this is just two words I love for life. And that is exceed expectations, exceed expectations. They want you there at nine o'clock. You get there at eight 50. They want 10 problems solved. You do 12. By the way, it's the same in relationships. My wife could be like, Oh honey, can you go to Trader Joe's and pick up fresh basil? We're making tomato sauce. If I walk in my home and I got fresh basil for my wife, I gave her exactly what she wanted. 
But you know what? If I stop off at the dry cleaners first, I go, honey, I got the basil. Look what else I got. Boom. Your dry cleaning exceed expectations. Give people more than what they want. That's how you build a relationship. And Mark, I came in the next day with my director, my co-director, and not to come into that meeting like she was expecting us to just listen to what was broken in the film. We were prepared to fix it with three new ideas. And then she's not judging the film. She's judging us. And she goes, you know what? These are the guys that are going to be able to go through the trenches and make this film. And she chose one of the other ideas and we made an entirely new movie. And that's where we got to really exceed expectations and show our potential. That's what I do. That's my tool. Whenever I'm up against it, I try to look at the parameters, but is there any other way I can be thinking? Is there anything else I can be doing? Can I open up the net a little bit more to maybe see something that I didn't see and bring that into it? I have nothing to say to that. That was amazing. What else is there? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so Saul, final question for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Mm, I love it. Uh, at the end of the day, for me, um, it comes down to one thing. I I'll answer it like this. You know, when I was, uh, when I was in college, I tried to get into Disney as an animator and I got rejected. It was incredibly competitive. There was no Pixar. There was no DreamWorks. And um, they picked 17 a year from thousands and thousands of portfolios to get that Disney internship. And I got rejected my first time trying. And I got rejected my second time trying. My best friend, Andy, gets in. He goes to Disney, the happiest place on earth. I'm in college, freezing in Ohio. I got rejected from my dream. And I gave up. I gave up on my dream. I didn't believe in myself anymore. That shoulder devil took control. And I was so depressed. And uh, I gave up on the dream. I thought, who was I to want to work at Disney? And if I could go back uh, in a time machine and listen to a conversation I had with my sister then. I remember talking to my sister one night. And I said to her, Rena, if I could sit at a table and draw Mickey Mouse, Every day for the rest of my life, the same drawing of Mickey Mouse, I would be happy. That's what I said. Because I just dreamed of working at Disney so much. But if I could go back to myself in a time machine now, you know what I would tell myself? Saul, grow up. You see, life is not just about how can I become happy. And for anyone listening right now, I guarantee 99% of the listeners right now are thinking, you know what I want in my life? I want to be happy. Like, what else could people want that's better than happy? We need to be careful because what makes us happy may not always be what's good for us. And happiness is usually dependent on outside occurrences. I would be happy if I got into Disney. I'd be happy if I got this promotion, if I met this girl, if I got this money. Those things would make me happy. But the truth is there's something so much sweeter than a life that's happy. That's a life of meaning. You ask me, what does it all come out to? One thing, I want to live a life of meaning. I want to live a meaningful life. And how do we do that? Only one way, to wake up every day and say, how does my passion, my ability, my interest, how can I use what makes me unique? How can I use that to serve humanity, to give to the world? Children wake up every day and they're like, you know what? I want to buy this. I want to get this. I take my kids to Target. They're like, I want this. I want this. Hopefully, when we become adults, we don't approach life with all the things we want to get. Hopefully, we approach life with how can I give? Because only when we give to humanity do we taste that life of meaning. That's what it comes down to me. I want to use my abilities and my art to have a, a meaningful life. I'm trying to make an impact. <laughs>